Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Rider podcast. Now, last week, I brought up the subject of law firms and how lawyers now have no choice but to embrace technological change. Why? Because their clients are now demanding it, because they've got a new level of expectation. So I reached out to Denton's, the world's largest law firm, who have over 9,000 lawyers and are also pioneering the intersection of technology and innovation in the legal industry. Specifically, I wanted to explore public policy and how lawmakers are handling legislation and regulation around emerging technologies. So last week we tackled autonomous vehicle legislation and what needs to be regulated before those vehicles hit the road. But today I invited Clint Vince of Denton's onto the show to talk about smart cities. And Clint Vince is the chair of Denton's US energy practice and co-chair of Denton's global energy sector. And he's rated as one of the leading energy attorneys in the US and has directed the expansion of the US energy team into a premier practice that includes professionals spanning the continent coast to coast and offering a full range of services to energy industry clients. He's widely recognised for his cutting edge theories and also solutions within the energy industry and has a top tier litigation track record. But most recently, Clint created the groundbreaking Denton Smart Cities Communities Think Tank, and he is one of the industry's leaders on this very subject. Perfect to get on this show. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to Washington so we can speak with Clint Vince from Denton's, who will tell us all about smart cities and the legal implications of them. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Clint. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Thank you, Neil. I chair the energy practice of the Denton's law firm, and I also lead their Smart Cities initiative. Uh, Denton's is a global firm with more than 10,000 attorneys, and we uh, our energy practice is uh, roughly about 1,000 of those attorneys. We're in about 79 countries, and I think we're in over 170 cities. So that's a subject that is uh, near and dear to our hearts. So Clint, you're rated as one of the leading energy attorneys in the US and have directed the expansion of the US energy team into a premier practice that includes professionals spanning the continent coast to coast, offering a full range of services to energy industry clients. But can you tell me a little bit more about your work and how it's actually helped you to be widely recognised for your cutting edge theories and solutions all within the energy industry as a top tier litigation track record? <laughs> well, that was such a generous introduction. I wonder if we could stop the interview right yeah. there. <laughs> One thing that, uh, that differentiates our energy practice is that we represent a lot of innovators and we also represent large cities that are modernizing their energy infrastructure. And that's a different approach than many other energy law firms undertake. So examples of our innovators would be a client called NetPower, which has just developed a technology to remove uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, natural gas-fired power plants. Uh, another innovator is the New York Power Authority which is creating the world's first digital utility, which will use uh, digital avatars for all of their uh, essential facilities, and they will um, create digital twins for their uh, major customers' uh, facilities as well. Third innovator is PDV Wireless, which is uh, creating a secure spectrum network for utilities across the country. And we represent major cities like New Orleans and San Antonio. We've won multi-billion dollar lawsuits for those cities, but what we're doing right now is helping them modernize, not just in the energy sector, but across the board, modernize their infrastructure. And that is uh, really an exciting new uh, type of practice for us. 
And you are doing some incredibly exciting work at the moment. And quickly, what springs to mind is your groundbreaking Denton Smart Cities Communications Think Tank. I mean, can you expand on that just for people listening that don't know anything about it? Yes. Uh, Denton's has created the world's first law firm think tank that's dedicated exclusively to smart cities and communities. We have more than 180 thought leaders from around the world. Uh, we have people like former Secretary of Energy, uh, Dr. Ernest Moniz, for our energy pillar of the think tank, uh, General Jim Jones, and uh, who was a former National Security Advisor and former Allied uh, Supreme Commander of uh, NATO, uh, handles cybersecurity uh, for the think tank. Uh, we have Morgan O'Brien, who created the first wireless network in the United States and lots of mayors and council members and uh, CEOs and also heads of uh, NGOs and, and uh, university officials. Now, when I think I think when many people listening think about IoT and smart cities and things like that, they automatically think about shiny new tech solutions that offer cool experiences. But what caught my eye and what I love about what you're doing is how you're actually solving real problems and actually saving billions of dollars for the ratepayers in the process. And a great example of that was the rebuilding of the New Orleans electric and natural gas systems that, of course, were devastated by Hurricane Katrina. Can you tell me more about that and how? How your team is assisting New Orleans with this highly advanced smart cities initiative? Yes, I think your your question is very insightful. Also, uh, uh, IoT and uh, data analytics and uh, artificial intelligence uh, are all involved with smart cities, but it's much more than uh, a shiny tech play, as you point out. Beyond uh, technology and beyond modernization of digital infrastructure, uh, our approach includes modernization of physical infrastructure and also social infrastructure. And that's why uh, the example you gave of New Orleans and uh, the devastation from Hurricane Katrina is a very good one. I had the, um, the task of being lead counsel for the city of New Orleans in rebuilding their entire uh, electrical and gas system after the destruction of Katrina, which involved uh, not just the hurricane, but also levee failures and extensive flooding throughout the city. So the city was evacuated for six weeks, something that had never happened before on that kind of scale. Uh, They had to, the entire electric system was was completely devastated. Their uh, gas system, they had to pump uh, about 4 million gallons of brackish water out of it. So ultimately, the gas system was uh, had to be almost entirely replaced as well. So someone at the time uh, described the devastation as really biblical. One thing that was very disappointing back then is because of antiquated laws dealing with disaster relief, uh, we could only get money in New Orleans for replacement of existing equipment. And I felt at the time we should have been uh, given the flexibility to modernize the infrastructure rather than just replace what was there. But now with um, the city of New Orleans uh, Smart Cities Initiative, Um, you know, my wish is coming true. And we actually are now looking forward and modernizing uh, the entire infrastructure. Now, we will have people listening to this podcast all over the world. So can I just ask that you try and set the scene and tell me a little bit about the kind of game changers that are going to impact the global energy sector? You know, there are so many, but I, I will list 10 and I'll try to do it very, very quickly. First, climate change and turbulent weather. This is very real, and it will be a huge force for change all around the world. Second, renewables, um, which are carbon-free sources of power, like wind and solar, as well as energy storage that will needed to be needed to uh, uh, help uh, with those intermittent resources. Third game changer is uh, continued low-cost, natural gas, which will 
allow the world to transition away from coal as a um, generating source and will also support greater development of renewables. Um, technology, you have uh, mentioned, the Internet of Things, uh, the Industrial Internet of Things, uh, data analytics, artificial intelligence, 5G, uh, things like that. Uh, many people talk about the fourth industrial revolution that's coming or underway, and I believe that's worth uh, studying. A fifth game changer is a change from the uh, electric grid going in one direction, which has been the case for the past century, to a multi-directional grid where consumers will finally be able to make their own purchasing decisions. Sixth game changer is cyber and physical security and also privacy and uh, data sharing issues. Uh, seventh will be asymmetrical competition that will come into the energy uh, industry from all different uh, new competitors, including the telecom industry, tech giants like uh, Google, and uh, major other players like uh, Amazon that have never really been in the uh, energy industry before. Um, an eighth game changer will involve mobility, including electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles, which will have a huge impact on energy. Uh, blockchain is going to affect everything, I believe. And then I think the smart cities and communities approach, um, because cities are going to need to address all of the game-changing trends that I've just mentioned. And um, right now, most of the world's population is migrating towards cities, and that trend will continue. Uh, most of the world's GDP comes from cities, and um, unfortunately, most of the world's pollution also comes from urban areas. So we need to focus on modernizing uh, our cities and communities uh, because that will be one location that will have the greatest impact. And just to choose one of those, I mean, you mentioned 5G there, which there's a lot of excitement about its potential at the moment. But what kind of role do you think that will play? And do you think it's it will move beyond the hype quite quickly? Yes, I think 5G is just about at the end of the hype cycle and is really now in the implementation stage. It's, it's starting to be implement, implemented across the U.S. now. It'll take years for full development and absorption, but it is uh, it now definitely is moving past the hype. Um, it's, it's beginning to get installed in a lot of major American cities. Another topic we mentioned there was blockchain, of course. So uh, uh, the only thing that seems to be holding it back at the moment is adoption. I mean, how far away do you think we are from mainstream adoption of blockchain applications in smart cities? Blockchain is one of the fastest developing trends. And like 5G, I think it's now beyond the hype cycle and is actually um, moving toward impl implementation. There have been a huge number of companies, uh, respected companies now getting into blockchain. Uh, so I, it's going to have impacts on everything from cybersecurity, uh, data sharing, currency, privacy. It will help to change the whole way that people around the world pay for things. And, um, you know, I, so we are studying blockchain very carefully and uh, we're a little bit in awe at how quickly it's developing. And there is so much exciting technology and so much exciting possibilities that it brings as a result of that. But of course, with all these different devices and big data, everything connected online all the time and the emergence of smart cities, where do you begin to secure data in a hyper-connected ecosystem? Well, that's a, uh, it's a complex and multifaceted question, but it's really a vital one also. I think at first, Cities will rely on utilities and telecom providers for their networks, but there are going to be really, really serious data security um, issues with that. I mentioned one of our clients, 
uh, PDV Wireless. Uh, they're developing a spectrum network for utilities that would be secure. And I think you're going to see more of that type of development. I think you're going to see more use of blockchain, as you mentioned in your preceding question. And this will be an issue that's going to tie up a lot of local governments uh, over the next couple of years as we go forward, because there is not um, complete agreement um, among constituencies as to what the best path forward is. Now, I'm glad you mentioned local governments there, because I think we've all got a different level of expectation now, because we come into our homes and you've got voice assistants and techno off your devices and even home appliances are all connected to the internet all the time. And then you go to your local government and it seems like you're going back in time. I mean, do you think that's going to change anytime soon with local governments and their services that they offer? Well, I, that's a very insightful question also, because uh, right now, a lot of the social infrastructure around the world is lagging behind uh, technological advances. So, you know, how do you modernize social infrastructure to keep up with technological change? We just talked about data sharing, but it's, it's going to involve all of the critical technological developments that will be encountered in cities and communities and beyond. So I think it's one of the more daunting issues. We, when we first started studying smart cities, we were surprised that most people talked about it as a technological play only, such as uh, Internet of Things and sensors and data analytics and so on. And very few people were talking about the need to modernize social infrastructure to keep up with it. So you have uh, targeted really one of the hardest issues that we're encountering. There are some cities that are doing a beautiful job with it. Uh, New Orleans has created a uh, standing committee of their city council to deal exclusively with um, smart and sustainable cities. Um, city of San Antonio is using their city-owned utility, which is CPS Energy. It's the largest electric and gas utility in the United States. They're using that as the fulcrum for grid modernization and coordination with uh, telecom and also transportation. You know, uh, New York, particularly under Mayor uh, Bloomberg, did a great deal of uh, advancement in this area. And as you say, your broadcast is or, or uh, approach is global. I think London has done a, a, a lot of great work. Uh, Singapore, um, Shanghai, Songdo in Korea, um, Parramatta in Australia. A, a lot of cities are really uh, ramping up on their social infrastructure and uh, and making some great modernization changes. So just for people listening then all over the world, can you just help them visualize your full vision of exactly what a smart city should look like, what you think it will look like, and maybe why it matters and why it's a genuine game changer in your opinion? Well, cities around the world will independently take different approaches, but I think there will be a lot of common themes. So I would anticipate that you're going to see uh, electric grids modernized around the world where a citizen or consumer can use a smartphone or electronic device to make their own uh, purchasing decisions, for example, with electricity for the very first time. And their appliances will be able to communicate with the utility so that they are uh, the appliances are consuming energy at the least expensive times and in the most efficient ways. I think autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles will really grow around the world. They're safer and cleaner. And I, as autonomous vehicles get developed, they'll be safer than um, today's drivers. But that will require 5G technology and, um, and also uh, continued development of, of uh, artificial intelligence. I think you'll see much better traffic flows which are going to be essential as more people migrate to cities. Uh, you'll see a lot more green lights and fewer red lights 
uh, because of coordination. Uh, we've talked about 5G. That hopefully will become ubiquitous, and um, it'll become available to everybody and will uh, function on a real-time, incredibly fast uh, basis. Uh, there'll be smart buildings, which will be far more efficient, um, much smarter and advanced street lighting. You'll see public safety receive the benefit of big data analytics, but also in, uh, in areas with high crime, for example. You'll see improvement in uh, gunshot sensors and then uh, immediate uh, communications to first responders, uh, impacts on the lighting in that area, uh, where the gunshot would be registered, and a lot of um, new other public safety applications. In terms of modern infrastructure, you'll even see trash collecting trucks that have sensors on them so that while they're collecting trash in a uh, location, they'll also be able to monitor the safety of the streets, whether there are potholes, they'll be able to communicate back to headquarters and have potholes fixed much more rapidly and on a coordinated basis. So I, I think you're just going to see the integration of all essential services for citizens, and they're going to get much better service, hopefully at a much lower cost and on a much more environmentally friendly basis. I love your vision and that picture you've painted there for the future. And I think we've covered I think we've covered a lot of ground today. It's going to leave people with a lot of questions and wanting to stay up to date with what you're doing with smart cities. So for everyone listening, what is the best way of keeping up to date with what you're doing with smart cities? And also if they want to reach out and contact a member of your team if they've got any questions um, about what you're doing there. Probably the, the easiest uh, way would be to send me an email at Clinton dot vince at dentons dot com and then we can um, direct questions or emails to members of the uh, smart cities and communities think tank and hopefully um, develop uh, responses or disseminate information uh, to interested parties the very concept of having a smart cities think tank, think tank is such a forward-thinking way of dealing with it, especially when we're looking at where there's a lot of hype around certain technologies here. So I love your approach. I love what you're doing. I'd love to stay in touch with you and see how this shapes out in the future. But more than anything, just a big thank you for coming on today. Thank you, Neil. It's been a real pleasure. When thinking of smart cities, I think we often think of shiny new tech solutions or, or large companies hoovering up our data and selling it to the highest bidder. But what I love about chatting with Clint was it was about solving real problems and actually saving billions of dollars in the process. And I loved hearing how Clint is credited with helping to save billions of dollars for the ratepayers of the city and assisting with the rebuilding of the city's electric and natural gas systems that were devastated by Hurricane Katrina. And Clint and his team are playing a lead role in assisting New Orleans with that highly advanced Smart Cities initiative. Great story, and I'm grateful that he took the time to come and chat with me today, because I think he enabled us all to see what a Smart City initiative should look like. But over to you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this one. So please email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com. Twitter and Instagram is just my name, Neil C. Hughes. I'm really interested in the kind of things that you think about when you think about a Smart City and what you thought of today's conversation. And also, of course, if you do need help with your business tech blogs or personal thought leadership articles, or just starting your own podcast, or indeed anything at all, you know where to find me by now. But I'm afraid once again we're out of time. But I will return tomorrow with another interview with another guest from another industry, and I hope you enjoy these as much as I do. If you do... I cordially invite you to join me tomorrow and we'll do it all again. But more than anything, just a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.